But uh, I just want to say what a privilege it is to follow Shamik and Tiana uh, because it's just excellent to have young, articulate voices from Palestine, from Syria, authentic voices, uh, people who've made a study of this as well as in their own experience. And I think that reality um, is something that we all need because after all, all three countries, Palestine, Syria, Venezuela, most people in this country haven't been to any of those countries. Most people in this country don't speak the languages they speak in those countries. And so it's important to have real human representatives and people who've also studied their own, the experience of their own country. I want to look at a few varying examples and focus a little bit on the method of looking at um, reading controversies. And I'm going to uh, combine some principles, some of which come from academic uh, study, the principles of academic research, but also some that come from uh, the criminal law, because when we start talking about evidence and the current controversy, I'm not going to talk about the one that Tiana talked about, the current one, which is all in the news, but quite a lot is coming out about the, the fabrications in that one. But when you start to look at something that specific, uh, it, a rather specific version of what's sometimes called fake news, um, we need to have some more exacting sort of principles to engage with that. But if we start with the broad concept of fake news, the BBC, in fact, is now going into British schools saying, saying, trying to teach children about what fake news is, which is sort of interesting. I thought we'd have a little run through the BBC's approach to doing that. And the people doing this are, of course, uh, journalists who are trained in journalism and trained with some basic ideas. And if you go through, the, this is a series of videos that they've put online. Um, and I've tried to distill the main points there. One, they say use lots of sources. Yes, I fair enough. Differing, differing and contrasting opinions. Yes, they tend to mix up opinions with facts when they sort of talk about this. But friendly questions helps interviewees loosen up. Yeah, fine, that's OK. Of course, the friendly questions go to certain types of people, and the antagonistic ones go to other types of people. Of course, beware, be careful of using the social media. People used to say this, don't trust the internet, you have to go, like in university, you have to go to a library and you have to go to an academic journal or something like that. Well, no, the internet is a difficult thing. There's a lot of rubbish on it and there's all the best stuff is there too. So the trick is how to read the internet, which is the major source of information from people in this country these days. It's outstripping television, thank goodness. But how do people read the internet is, is the next step, really. And I suppose I'm, I'm, a lot of these examples I'm talking about people who are serious readers or analysts or researchers, because some of these things the average person, frankly, doesn't have the time for, and um, they are much more passive in the way that they access um, information. Uh, they talk about facts as being beyond dispute. Well, that's often not the case. Often there's a lot of contest. Uh, and they talk about the need for verification. That's true. But how are you going to verify these sorts of things? So I've got a little green box here. My green box says, Corroboration and reliance on reputable sources sounds good, but how are we going to do this thing? Now, the problem is that reputable sources are often at the centre of fake news scandals. If you go to something like Wikipedia, which is now linked into Google, Google's now a major funder of Wikipedia, Google's now linked to the White House as well, they use that principle of, really they do a resume of the media, and they rely on what they consider to be reputable sources, including the BBC, and they reject the tabloids, for example, and they reject you know, the Russian media and the Syrian media and the Iraqi media and the Venezuelan media and the Cuban media and so on. So they have their own version of what reputable sources are. Um, fake news isn't something that was invented with the US election of two years ago. A lot was spoken about there. In fact, one of the important uh, studies of fake news was about a decade before that, where they discovered that the television in the US, which at that time, a little bit less so now, was corrupted by major corporations. They were basically producing these things called VNRs, video news releases, and journalists being working under pressure and being lazy, basically, and doing a lot of plagiarism, um, would found this very appealing. The, the journalists that were hired by the corporations to put out a video news release, here's you know, 30 seconds, fine, the journalists says fine, they run them. They found dozens and dozens and dozens of cases of the corporate media in the US simply running those corporate video news releases. And after a while, a few years later, on 2011, the, the regulator, the media regulator in the US decided to start prosecuting people for not disclosing these sorts of things. There's been a little bit about this in this country too. But, so fake news has been spoken in that context. It was a phenomenon of the major media channels. It wasn't about 
uh, some blogger in Perth or some someone who's never been called a, a Russian bot in Perth or some, someone else, uh, Sarah Bell, a Lebanese girl in, in, um, in Canada or something. It was about the commercial media. The BBC itself was exposed in many fake news stories uh, by other media channels. Um, I won't even go through these. Um, I'll let you read them. I'll put these online so you can have a look at them. Um, but, but the lesson I, I suggest there, a reputable source is insufficient. Yes, look for the source, that's important, but that's not enough. We have to have a little bit more than that. Um, in international controversies, where, as I said, we don't know the country, we don't know the language of the people, we can be told all sorts of things about brutal Arab dictators, or I remember back in the Vietnam War it was cruel communist Asians, you know, the yellow peril that was going to invade Australia. Really, there's an evocation of racial stereotypes during a war in particular, and there are particular dangers of propaganda, as Tiana pointed out, and Shamit also pointed out, during the war. During the war, the intensity of these sort of contradictions is heightened. You know, our need, the need for our senses to be sharper to look at these sort of contradictions is there. Shamit did a very effective deconstruction of one story, which was good because it point, you know, there was what, 107 Palestinians killed, and the whole focus of the news was on one Israeli soldier who'd been kidnapped, you know, yeah. and you saw it in one, in one, uh, graphic there, more or less. One thing I'd like to say is that uh, if the principle of research where we look for primary sources, you know, we don't look for someone reported in someone else, we go back to see as primary a source as we can. It applies to these international conflicts. It means that we have to look at the news from the country as well. So far as possible, news from the country. You know, people are prohibited to look at news from Russia and, and Syria and Iraq and so on these days, but we have to start there. Why would we look for news about Australia in China, for example? Um, I may not like the media in Australia, but if there's something about some scandal in Australia, I would look at the Australian media for Australian news. Why? In, in the first case, because there's not because there isn't bias, there's bias in every country, but because there's detail there. If you have more detail, you can read between the lines. If you have no detail, you just have spin, you can't read between the lines, doesn't matter how good a reader you are. So detail matters, and I'll show you some examples of this in a moment. Um, and I suggest using primary sources, the principle, one of the, the principles of academic research, includes in international disputes in country sources. Take great care with news from strategic adversaries, you know. This is sort of particularly obvious in the case of the US, which pretends to be an arbiter, a moral arbiter of, of disputes, but itself is directly involved in conflicts, directly involved in armed conflicts. You can't on basic principles of conflict of interest, saying you are both an arbiter and a, uh, an activist, a proponent in, a, in an armed conflict. It goes against the common sense to be referred to. But it's a principle well understood in liberal discourse and everyday administration of government and law and so on. There are such things as conflict of interest. We can't have the umpires being the people that are playing the game. Um, North Korea is a special case in a way, and here we have the corporate media has run a lot of amazing stories about North Korea, basically. In this case, I've just highlighted there is four defectors who are said to be executed. Well, they discovered a bit later on that three of them were alive, and the one that, was, that had died was said to be a pack of, fed to a pack of wild dogs. He wasn't fed to a pack of wild dogs. So the corporate media exposed all that. The lesson from that is just ignore everything they say about North Korea in that case. <laughs> Here's the BBC again. Now, this is something that touched me in particular when I saw it. The, one of the official al-Qaeda groups in Syria, Jabhat al-Nusra, threatened to murder the senior Quranic scholar in Syria, Sheikh al Bouti. Now, Sheikh al Bouti was in his 80s. Um, uh, he, they threatened to kill him. They did kill him by exploding a bomb in a mosque and killed another 40 people. They celebrated killing him, and then they blamed the government. Now, that's an interesting pattern. Um, and what makes it worse, I think, is that the BBC, uh, which is a reputable source, and therefore you will find this linked into the biographical entry of Sheikh al Bouti in Wikipedia, the BBC repeated the Al Qaeda uh, lie that uh, perhaps the government had killed him. Perhaps they hadn't done it, even though it was filmed. The blood on the carpet is shown there. Um, they made some issue about this, the closed circuit TV not having a very loud sound there, because closed circuit TV aren't hi-fi systems, basically, they're little cameras. Um, so, war brings out the worst in media bias. Um, what happened, the, the, the assassins, uh, none of them were, were captured, they confessed, 
I was in Damascus in December 2013 when that confession was shown on television. None of that mattered. Because the BBC said it, um, they have this now um, uh, basically uh, fudging, the, fudging the issue. Authoritative sources. Here's Amnesty International, you know, which um, my mother had, had little uh, letter writing groups for Amnesty International in the 60s when we were writing letters to, to free prisoners of conscience. Somewhere along the line, something changed with Amnesty because in the first Gulf War, which is now 28 years ago, Amnesty backed this story of a nurse who said that Iraqi soldiers were taking babies out of incubators and throwing them onto the cold floor so they could steal the incubators. It turned out that the Kuwait, Kuwaiti monarchy had paid $11 million to a PR firm to coach this girl and a few other things in her testimony. It was a complete lie. It was exposed in major media in, in, uh, in the US, in I think 60 Minutes did a story on it and so on, 28 years ago. Amnesty International backed up that story. They said they had corroborating evidence for that story. What happens later on, you know, on the 10th anniversary of the invasion of Afghanistan, a US State Department official became the head of Amnesty International and praised the NATO occupation of Afghanistan, the new feminist war of the 21st century. Um, keep the progress going, Amnesty did on billboards that were posted all around. Um, the invasion of the NATO bombing of Libya, French Amnesty International backed the stories that Gaddafi was using black mercenaries to murder civilians and including rape women as well. Uh, well, after Gaddafi was murdered and the state was destroyed, the head of Amnesty International France, Genevieve Garagos, says, well, we didn't really have any evidence for that. So be careful about the track record of these organisations that present themselves. Be wary of emotional pleas in the lead-up to interventionist war. Subject all war claims from whatever source to careful scrutiny. And have regard to the history of some of these groups. Uh, Tiana mentioned the, the Iraq, the Iraqi, um, the Iraqi uh, story. Um, I just want to make the point here that here they had an Iraqi voice, a man called Ahmad Chalabi, who became too corrupt for anyone to tolerate in Iraq after a while, but he was part of an exile group that the US was funding at the time. When I said look at in-country sources, I meant in-country sources, not exile groups that are funded by the big powers. Here's another one. Um, a recent book by an Israeli journalist, Roman Bergman, is a catalogue of the assassinations by Israeli intelligence, Mossad. He documents 2,700 assassinations by Mossad. Now, some people say that in a conflict you avoid the enemy media. And I say, here's where we need to use a principle from criminal law. If someone is, has an interest involved, and here there's a question about whether this journalist is an interested party or not an interested party, uh, because he's an Israeli, maybe, I mean, I know some people in other Lebanese and a lot of Arab countries say that in itself makes them an interested party, because, you know, Lebanese international two years ago, Philip Luther, who says, uh, and Amnesty is, is critical of Israel about Palestine, but he's also critical about the Palestinians trying to qualify himself for certain audiences. He says, the Palestinian armed groups repeatedly launched unlawful attacks during the conflict, killing and injuring civilians. He didn't really document it very well. They displayed a flagrant disregard of international law. All the rockets used by Palestinian armed groups are inherently indiscriminate. You will find this a lot, this phrase, in, inherently indiscriminate, without any evidence to it. Uh, there's a colleague at this university, Jake Lynch, who says the same sort of thing. A little bit more strongly, he says that Israel's high-tech weaponry was far more disproportionate in terms of violence, but he says the rockets fired in Hamas militiamen is a bit of an overstatement because Hamas is not the only group involved in armed resistance in, in Palestine or in Gaza. But uh, he says also indiscriminate weapons. So they're both criticizing Israel, but the backhander is there for the Palestinian resistance. Um, uh, maybe Shamik's example was a bit stronger than that, but I want to point to this, this concept of a Qualify. We can actually measure the indiscriminate nature or not of, of, um, of Palestinian rockets. There's a way to do it. Mm -hmm. By looking for independent evidence and or admissions against interest to test those assumptions. And from evidence from uh, the casualty figures from Israel and from the European Union, so you know, a party that's relatively independent and a party that's registering this stuff potentially against its interest, can't say they're biased to um, play down the number of civilian casualties uh, in, in Israel, let's say. 
Um, but you come up with this figure, basically, that the Israeli assault on Gaza in 2014, more than 75% of the 1,088 people killed were civilians from independent evidence. And 6% of the 51 killed in that time were civilians in Israel. So none of that is relying on interested party sources, self-serving statement and interested party sources. So there, um, the lessons from there. If we can find independent evidence, it's goal in this sort of conflict. We should look for that sort of independent evidence or uh, the uh, admissions against interest. Be wary of these moral equivalence claims. This is part of the problem, I think, uh, Somewhere, I think Jay mentioned this, the idea of moral equivalence, that you just say, well, this is all a bit difficult, they're both as bad as each other, or one's a bit worse than the other. You see it in Syria now, often they revert to an ISIS, Assad, they're as bad as the other, or Assad's worse than ISIS, and so on. Um, uh, those moral equivalence claims carry inbuilt assumptions, which sometimes we can test. The other thing is, both the objectives and the actions of the party important. It wasn't just how many people were being killed, it's a question of, why the violence was occurring, and were not the Palestinians entitled to defend themselves against uh, a violence which is essentially an apartheid violence and often an ethnic cleansing violence. Here's one on Syria. And this one, a lot of the corporate media swallowed, basically. It was a survey of a large number of Syrian refugees in Germany. It, I think there was over 800, 890, something like, refugees in Germany that was commissioned by a group called the Syria Campaign, funded from, literally from Wall Street in New York, um, carried out by a German academic and some partners in Germany, um, in five towns in Germany. And the headline was, the press release was, 70% uh, of refugees are fleeing Assad. Um, and so uh, this is a graphic from one of the media. I remember Deutsche Welle, the German state media, uh, international state media outlet ran it as that. They all ran the headline, 70% of refugees. Remember the fake news, the video news reports in, in 2006? There was nothing in, if you read the survey, here's the first lesson, read the detail. In the survey, Assad was not mentioned. His name was not mentioned at all. Okay, so how do they get the 70%? I think. Um, 70% in the survey, you will find that 70% of these people said they were worried about uh, potential violence or, or uh, harassment by the Syrian army. Okay? So maybe that's where, the, that's where the thing came from. 90% said they were worried about violence or harassment from the anti-government armed groups. What do you see there? You thought that maybe 70% were fleeing Assad and 20% were fleeing the armed groups. No, it didn't add up to 100. It added up to more than 100 there. And what's worse, it wasn't a proper survey in the sense of being statistically significant of refugees. The number of refugees in Germany, and there's a lot of them, the number of refugees at that time in Europe was about 4 million, but in Germany it was, it was a large number. They were 68% young men. The refugee population that big is pretty much like a normal population. It's half and half men and women. The age groups reflect society. This was 68% young men. 74% were from jihadist held areas at a time when the jihadists couldn't have held more than 15% of the territory in Syria, the populated areas in Syria, sorry I should say. These are unseen maps with that desert and so on like that. Populated areas was the critical point. So check for a sampling method in an era. If someone has done a statistically representative poll, they will have had to justify some sort of random sampling and they will also have to state a sampling error like Fortunate error. Read the detail. There was nothing in the the uh, in the actual survey that they carried out. We don't know how they sampled, but we know that they came up with a very skewed group of people. Hardly anyone from Tartus, Latakia, Sueda, very few from Damascus. But 68% young men, 74% from those areas, and the poll didn't say what they said. Venezuela. The current problem with research in Venezuela is that the, the current propaganda campaign. Ten years ago, it was about poverty figures. It was a big debate about poverty figures in an economic crisis in 2003, 2004. The current one is about hunger. Now, you'll find all across the, the US media um, the, these allegations that Venezuelans are dying of hunger. This proves the failure of socialism, and so on and so on. Over 15% of people eat garbage to survive. Venezuela has become a starvation state. Half of Venezuelan children are not getting through school. 
if you follow the BBC rules, one of these reputable sources, I don't know if the Daily Beast is a reputable source or Great Heart, the New York Times probably they would say is, is reputable, and the UK Telegraph, I don't, I don't know, I'm not sure what they, but this is the corporate media basically anyway. Um, saying the same thing, it looks like corroboration, doesn't it? Of course, the problem is we haven't gone to Venezuela. None of this stuff is coming from Venezuela. It's coming from the U.S. media. Um, they've got some. They've chosen some Venezuelan sources. Um, they've chosen some photos. Look at the, the interests and the limitations of your sources, particularly as regards to power and language. And notice also there's this huge ideological conflict going on uh, between the U.S. and Venezuela for some time. Venezuela is a key target, a key uh, enemy, if you like, of the U.S. ever since the early 2000s. Check the other side of the story. That's simple enough, isn't it? You know, normally, journalists are trained to do this sort of stuff. Um, uh, of course, if the journalist uh, has the sort of loyalty that that BBC journalist that Tiana showed interviewing the BBC military man, then they don't want to muddy the waters, as she said, by raising some doubts about it. But if you, they can just say this is regime propaganda, basically. Of course, you can say that about any, any country's media, basically. Um, the Venezuelan government says, this is actually last year, um, and part of it is the year before, or oh, a year and a half ago. The Venezuelan government says food shortages are caused by politicized commercial orders, that it's addressing the problem through social programs such as school feeding. There's no general food crisis. Okay, at least you've looked at the other side of the story. Step three, check for independent evidence. Okay, there's a conflict, you're getting two different stories. Is there independent evidence throughout? Yes, there is. The Food and Agriculture Organization, the UNDP, are in Venezuela, they've been there for a very long time. Okay, maybe you have to, um, maybe it isn't all in, uh, in English, but you know, it's not that difficult to translate things these days. Um, the FAO uh, recognize, again recognizes Venezuela for its um, food security work. Uh, the FAO dismisses false stories about Venezuela. So you've got independent sources there. Um, a couple of them are a little bit old, 2015, you have to check your dates. Often people recycle old stories, so in the final step you would work backwards to the source to see if the independent, for example, the Chinese, the Chinese media. The Chinese media may not have the same bias, although they'd be using sometimes similar sources. Um, and check it to see that the independent evidence was cited correctly. So there's a few steps you can go through to see uh, what's going on there. The European Union now has virtually a ministry of truth. It's called EU versus disinfo, and guess what? It's telling you what to believe about international conflicts that the EU is involved, directly involved in, so therefore self-serving statements. Um, this is a bit like the ministry of truth in George Orwell's famous novel, 1984. Um, so apply the self-serving statement rule here. The EU has got some conflict with Russia, and um, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Here, in summary, the principles um, that I've tried to put together. The perspective on the, the issue is essential, I think, that Tiana made that point. Beware of assertions from strategic adversaries. Identify <coughs> the interests that are involved in and try and discount self-serving statements and make use of admissions against interest. It's in the case of the Israelis talking about the large number of assassinations that their intelligence service have carried out, most of them in Israel, but many of them in other countries. You know, for example, I think they, uh, they have successfully banned Hezbollah or a section of Hezbollah in many countries around the world, but Hezbollah has never been accused of as many assassinations as Israel has, has carried out, even outside the immediate area. Carefully read the detail. Remember that refugee survey? Uh, it, the, the, the PR statement, the covering letter, was entirely uh, misrepresenting the survey. Don't just read the headlines. I can tell you from a few stories a little bit of media abuse I've copped that the, the headline had no justification in the story at all. That's, I come back to the point about detail. Detail is important, even if it's a, a source that you don't trust at all. If there's a level of detail in there, it may be possible to read through the line, read between the lines. If it's just a spin story, you can't read anything between the lines. Use more primary sources, including in international conflicts, in-country sources. You would find English language media in most countries of the world these days. It's not that difficult. Uh, there's sometimes some, some quite good media sources. Um, use multiple and varied sources. Yes, agree with the BBC there. Beware of these moral equivalence claims. Usually it's someone who has had some problems with their particular line and they've fallen back into a cynical position, which is very attractive to the Western mind. Cynicism is very attractive. You give up, you say they're all as bad as each other, and a plague on them all, a plague on all your houses. 
it's really an admission of failure to be able to look into and investigate those conflicts. And of course, look for those independent sources where possible. One final little thing, I think, because the people who criticise these wars are often called conspiracy theorists. Here's the, one of the, the, mega, the mega stories. Huh? The Washington and Al-Qaeda, to what extent is uh, Washington and Al-Qaeda? You will find most corporate media will dismiss these sorts of things, even though the US government has admitted them many times. <laughs> Uh, here's where the admissions against interest are important because uh, it may be against the official story that the US is funding arming uh, Jabhat al-Nusra and ISIS and a number of these other groups, but to different degrees, whether openly or, or in the various leaks we have from the US intelligence. Uh, early days of the Syrian war, for example, the extremist groups were the major forces driving the insurgency in 2012. They want to create a Salafi principality, an Islamic state in eastern Syria. That's exactly what the US and its allies want. So there are a lot of admissions on the record there, and uh, those admissions are important, at least to temper self-serving public policy, public statements. Thanks, folks.